Hello, everybody. I'm sorry that there was a difficulty with the audio to start with. Um, I will go back to the beginning. We are without our, our tech master, um, and uh, so I am flying blind today a little bit. So we have today is our uh, key stakeholders, part three, how to reach out and inform key stakeholders at our institutions. I was pointing out that we have the question section on our dashboard is where you can put any questions that you have. Some of you were very great about uh, sharing with us that you were having difficulty with the audio, so I was able to move forward, thankfully. And also you will see that in there is a handout section um, on your dashboard where you can go ahead and download this uh, the slide deck should you choose to. The PowerPoint and the recording will be available for your use um, in about a week after this uh, presentation. So today, the overview of our webinar is that we will be having three presenters. Our, pre our presenters represent three different um, types of institutions so that you can get an idea of the kind of work that they're doing to inform key stakeholders at their institution. We'll begin with a two-year institution, move on to a four-year public, and the last institution will be with a four-year private nonprofit, and we'll be happy to take your questions at the end of the presentation. If you have any questions, as we've discussed, you may enter them into the question box. The question box will um, be reviewed as we go through this presentation. And if there are any questions about audio, as we've seen already, um, we'll be glad to manage that. And then at the end, we'll take any substance questions from the presenters. And the presenters will be happy to answer those. And if we are not able to complete all of the questions that are put into the question box, we will um, we will make sure and uh, we have those banked and so we'll then share those questions with our presenters and submit the answers to those questions to all of you for you to benefit from the answers to those questions. And I'm Cheryl Dowd, I'm the Director for State Authorization Network with WCET. Our presenters today, first we'll have Hillary Burgess Jackson, she is with Sinclair Community College. She's been the compliance coordinator for e-learning student support at Sinclair Community College in Dayton since October of 2015. And honestly, I had the pleasure of, of working with Hillary at Sinclair prior to my coming to WCET. Hillary works primarily on issues involving state authorization, but also contributes to the division in other research and project related roles. Prior to this, Hillary's career includes more than a decade of experience in the legal field, including practicing civil litigation defense in scenic Oregon and Washington, as well as working in house personal and commercial line claims in the insurance industry. Our second presenter will be Corey Stokes. He's the Digital Learning Officer at the University of Utah. He oversees the University of Utah's digital learning strategy, curriculum service teams, and the U um, online program. Over the past 16 years, he has led large-scale educational technology initiatives crossing Utah's higher educational system, nationwide public research universities, and the public broadcasting system. Before coming to the University of Utah, he managed digital media production teams for e-learning companies serving clients such as Apple, Chrysler, KeyBank, and the Department of Defense. And our last presenter today is Joy Verner. She is the Compliance Coordinator for the Pennsylvania College of Health Sciences. When Joy started her undergraduate studies, distance education meant going at least an hour away from her hometown to study speech communications at then Edinburgh State College. After a two-year stint as a disc jockey, Joy segued into college student affairs work and spent seven years on the front line of small private colleges. Armed with an MS degree in counseling from Shippensburg University, Joy transitioned into regulatory compliance roles and spent a dozen years working in state and local government. She was thrilled to return to a college campus in 2008, where she spent five years as a student development administrator at Dickinson College. Her first inkling that state authorization was a major area of focus in higher education circles came a mere nine days after she was hired by Pennsylvania College of Health Sciences in March 2014 where she has since served as the Institutional Research and Compliance Coordinator. In addition to navigating distance education regulation, Joy oversees the Clery Act Compliance, dabbles in gainful employment disclosures, and serves as Deputy Title IX Coordinator. We are very pleased to have these three presenters with us today. And we'll start today with Hillary Burgess Jackson, who will be giving us an insight into how she was able to work with key stakeholders at a public two-year institution. Hillary? Great. Thanks, Cheryl. 
So as Cheryl mentioned, I've been in this role for about two years. I always like to give a little shout out to Cheryl for leaving things in such good order when I took over this position. Um, but I found I'm continually learning new things about interacting with stakeholders here at Sinclair uh, concerning state authorization. And so I'm happy to share today what I found to be helpful so far. So just as kind of a quick overview, I'm gonna be talking today about um, the following which have been helpful to me. So first identifying kind of the who and what of what I'm working with. Um, my approach with what I term the quote decision makers on an issue. How it's been helpful for me to at least start with one um, using resources that are readily available to me in my department and finding other reasons to communicate with people or departments. Next slide, please. Thank you. So when I speak about identifying, what I really mean is identifying what needs to be done, identifying who or what will be impacted by that. And I found that by doing that, you end up communicating with a lot of people along the way and you end up finding those main stakeholders that you need on a particular issue. And while you do so, you make your name kind of known along the way. So um, specifically, I try to start with whatever regulation that I'm working with, but whether it's a SARA requirement, federal regulations, um, state regulations, and then I, I try to marry those to the programs or issue that I'm working on to determine what's applicable. So um, from there, I can determine exactly what the issue is that needs to be done, for example, like with licensure disclosures. And then when I'm envisioning that, I can identify both broadly and individually um, who or what will be impacted by that, like departments, programs, the registrar, things like that. That reveals to me who I'll be connecting to in the process of the state authorization compliance on those issues. Specifically, I've also found that it's really helpful to conduct exercises in hypotheticals. I found that if I jump into a communication with someone with general information about state authorization, a lot of eyes tend to glaze over because they just may not see how it's applicable to them. So I found that if I do some exercises in hypotheticals about, say, a particular student in one of their programs, if it's possible that they could go out of state for something, and then usually they say, oh, that has happened once, or yes, we may not deny that opportunity to that student. Then all of a sudden it becomes kind of relatable to them, even if it's just a hypothetical. So I found that to be pretty useful. I also try when I can to get a perspective on where state authorization may fit for that person or that department from their perspective. So because it may be new to them or it may be foreign to them or they've only heard about it in passing, and I can try to understand what their priorities are so that we can try to get on the same page with where state authorization may fit into that. Next slide, please. So what I, what I term the decision makers. So I try to ask on a particular issue, who's going to be making the decision on that issue, like the ultimate decision at the end of the day on that issue. Then I try to look backward to determine all of the others that will be involved in that before moving it forward. So I found with state authorization, sometimes it comes as a surprise to me to discover like all of the departments or individuals that may kind of need to weigh in or sign off on a particular issue. So when I've identified that project or goal, I figure out who's going to be making the ultimate end decision, whether it's, for example, the registrar or the general counsel on whether or how we're going to proceed on something. And then I determine those that are going to be involved or have to sign off kind of along the way. And I try to take all of that information with me to the ultimate decision maker because I found that gives me a more complete picture of the issue I'm working on. But that also gives the decision maker kind of helps them make a more informed decision about it as well. And again, then in the meantime, you're keeping everyone informed along the way. Next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, I'll just keep going. So the next one I found is to kind of start with one. So what I mean by this is to kind of at least get someone on your side to help open the door. Um, because I found that sometimes all it takes is one key person or one key meeting to get your name to get your name out of there out there. So I'm not hearing anything, Cheryl, are you? 
Yeah, uh, this is Cheryl. Um, Hillary, are you able to um, unmute? And the picture uh, shows on the audience view the slide three. Uh, is there anything that I can do to help you? I'm here. Can you? Can now you we hear, hear me? you. Yes. Yes. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> I lost you for a minute. Okay. So where did we leave off? We I, were I don't talking know about where starting I with one. Oh, perfect. Okay. So what I found that's really helpful is we've heard this before, but I found it's very helpful to really get someone on your side to help open the door. Um, because once you're fully in that door, then you can kind of really explore what's on the other side and, and use that to your advantage. So um, for example, here at Sinclair, I have a very supportive dean who she gets it when it comes to state authorization. And I found that having that on your side has created kind of a domino effect. So once one dean is on board, then it kind of gives some additional credence to what I'm saying when I email the other deans. Um, at the general counsel is also informed here about state authorization and having her on, on our side with that, it can also be very helpful. So I even carbon copy them on emails when I need to, because again, whatever you can do to kind of make your voice heard about the importance of state authorization, I have found to be helpful. The other thing, um, I try to be conscious of being a source of expertise on this issue um, to the extent anyone can be, you know, to be a comfort to some of these people that you're talking with, because you don't want to just present the information and have them freak out that they need to be doing all of this research or become the expert on the issue. So if you can convey to them that this is your job and you're working on this, it also conveys to them the importance of the work that you're doing. Next slide, please. So next, um, I found it very helpful to use the resources that are readily available. So Ed Sinclair here, State Authorization, and my position, they're housed in e-learning. So I kind of have the in on working with academic coaches and our instructional designers. Um, so I found this to be very helpful in kind of identifying solutions that I otherwise would not have known about. So uh, for example, I was able to work with the with some of our instructional designers to come up with um, something through our LMS to automate a notification system to our students in some of our online courses. So as we were exploring this, I was able to kind of put that together, take that information to some of the programs and departments that were impacted, and then I had that available as a at least a potential solution when discussing this need to notify students this issue. So I've also found that doing things like that, using these resources, um, it kind of helps build your momentum with some of the state authorization work so that now when you're presenting these issues, not only are you kind of giving them a possible solution to it, but they can also see big picture that this isn't just issues, that there are some workable solutions to the state authorization issue. Next slide, thank you. So my last one here is um, using other reasons for communication. And what I mean by that is I try to ask if there are other reasons to contact a department or a person that tie in with state authorization. So I found that it can be a bit tiresome to kind of repeatedly ask for just somewhat random meetings about state authorization where I'm just kind of giving them the information. But I try to look and see if there's another reason that's kind of relevant on its own merits to a particular department and try to use that as my in to that department and then kind of backdoor the state authorization issue in there. So for example, um, reviewing web pages for consistent information, whether it's with gainful employment and whether that's consistent with state authorization information that's posted out there, I've done that as well so that I can use that as a reason to meet, for example, with financial aid, but I can phrase it as something termed about gainful employment. So that that way it automatically kind of hits home for them and says gainful employment, that's something that, you know, the lights go on for them about gainful employment, whereas otherwise they may not have just about state authorization. But then when I get in there, I can say this is the reason that I'm looking at it and I want it to be consistent with state authorization. And by the way, here's information on state authorization. Another example of that is working with marketing um, because our department, of course, has information um, posted in our academic policy and program guide. So um, I can use a review of that to convey the importance of state authorization to the marketing department, getting that information out there. But that way I have a specific reason to touch base with marketing um, concerning that academic policy and program guide and about updates to that rather than just a general email about state authorization. 
I find there's something specific from a perspective that they can relate to in their own department. So those are some of the approaches that I found to be helpful. And, um, and thank you. Thank you very much, Hillary. That was really helpful. It sounds like you did a lot of brainstorming to determine who on campus you would want to interact with and learn what they do so that you can have good communication with them to help pursue the information that you need for compliance standards. Um, thanks very much for being with us. And next we have Corey Stokes, who's the Digital Learning Officer with the University of Utah. Corey? Thanks, Cheryl. And uh, wow. I think you've probably received as many tips in just the first presentation as I could digest in one webinar. That was really great. Uh, so I'll see what I can add here. Um, in my role at the University of Utah, I oversee all of the online program operations and I interact with a lot of stakeholders across the university from the provost to department chairs, deans, right down to individual faculty developing and delivering online programs. And it seems like you have to have this state authorization conversation at every single level of the university. Um, so my first key to reaching out to all these stakeholders is first of all, to really, really understand the process. And if you don't have a process, get one. Uh, it is well worth taking the time to go through formal business process design for how state authorization is going to fit into your university operations and getting the stakeholders together in a room to do that business process design is important. For us, what came out of that process uh, was this simple infographic. And this is an infographic that I use when I sit down with the provost. Uh, it was given to all of the deans at our Council of Academic Deans meetings as we began talking about uh, state authorization and online programs at the university. But really what it does is it sets it into context and it's, it, it makes everybody aware that somewhere along this path, we're going to have a conversation about state authorization. And you may not know what that means now, but you will. And when we get to this point, remind us to have this conversation. Everybody understands row, the first row, finding the person holding the bag of money to develop the program. Faculty and departments understand the middle row really well. That's the developing of the course. It's the bottom row that almost nobody knows anything about in the process. What do we have to do in terms of our state authorization requirements and, and what checklists can we develop? What do we have to do with our accrediting body to make sure we're okay around all of those regulations? And Oft times the state authorization information and the accreditation notification information is the same info. And so when you gather it for one, you're really gathering it for the other. Uh, and finally, how are you going to present all this and package it so that in our case, it goes to our undergraduate and graduate council before we actually give the online classes the right designation in the scheduling system and add them onto our website and engage with marketing to begin marketing those programs. So the first tip is know your standardized process, publish it, get all the state, come up with one process and share it with everybody. Second is really taking state authorization from the realms of mystery and simply presenting it to all stakeholders as this is risk management for the institution. Um, Departments, especially at a large research university, departments and colleges will do whatever they want to do. And they can get away with it for a long time because it's hard to know what everybody's doing. Um, but when they understand that really it's about controlling the risk to the university, it's about the financial risk, it's about the risk to the university brand and the reputation of their program, um, that's, that's the conversation we want to be having because then people really kind of sit up and listen and say, oh, I didn't realize there were risks. I, I thought this was just some bureaucratic red tape that you all make us jump through. To, what do you mean risk? Um, so we talk about that and, and the risks of operating in another state and violating their laws and, and, and how easy we can make it to manage that risk. And that goes to the third point, making state authorization a proactive campus service. It's not just a person in an office buried somewhere in the organization. It's a service that is promoted out to the deans, the department chairs, the program heads that says, 
when you get to the spot in the process about state authorization, if you don't know what that is or how to engage around it, don't worry about it. All you need to know is we have a service, this is who you contact, and that service is going to walk you through templates, questions, consultations. In our case, we pretty much do all of the legwork for the department in, in filling out and, and drafting statements and information packets. Uh, we pass it back to them, have them verify that it's all correct. But we kind of package it all up because we know that, that a lot of the same information is going to end up going in our accreditation notification packet. And that's got to follow a, a very specific format. And so we just make that a service that we do for the departments. And it takes a lot of the stress out of this. And it just lets the dialogue flow. Um, part of that is certainly including the course development team, as, as was said in the previous, uh, previous slides. The people who know best whether some, a, a course or a curriculum, there are design elements that are going to be happening as that course and curriculum is being taught, if it's going to trigger something in, around state authorization, we can know that at the time that it's being designed. In fact, we have a rubric that is part of our, our course uh, evaluation, our, our formative evaluation process, um, where we actually walk through seven to eight typical triggers, and we just check the course and say, does any of this activity happen in the learning activities of this course? If yes, then we know to get in a deeper conversation. But the instructional design team are on their toes watching just to see if any of these typical triggering events are happening. And uh, of course, we'd be happy to share our uh, instructional design state authorization rubric with everybody. Um, Amanda Babcock, who many of you know, developed that with our instructional design team. And finally, once you have gathered all this information about your authorization in different states and, and how different programs relate to that information, store that information in your curriculum management system. Um, for us, we use a system called Kuali Curriculum Management, and it stores all the information about the program as it's proposed, the courses that are part of that program, the learning outcomes, it's all stored in the curriculum management system, and we simply add a few metadata fields to that system that talk about state authorization, and are there any particular states where we need to really be careful with this program? So we just make those notes right in the system of record about that program, so that we don't have to keep asking the same questions over and over again. Uh, when that program comes up for review, uh, we just ask those questions and verify that nothing's changed about it with regard to state authorization. When we have regulators from other states call, we have one database that we can go to. And uh, everybody who works in the curriculum management area of the university can see that information. Uh, it, it's great exposure just letting everyone who works around the curriculum understand that state authorization, it, th this is an integral part of the way a university operates today. This isn't some sort of side boutique, interesting thing. It's a core part of the way the university works. So I, I guess when it finally comes down to it, the real value that I saw is when I sat down with our Associate Vice President for Budget and Planning early on as we were doing online, we talked about state authorization and the costs involved. Uh, at that time, we were not members of SARA. And getting the budget to be able to take care of authorization and the bonds and things that you have to have with different states, um, it's a big conversation with your budget vice president. Once she understood exactly what it was, the risks we were dealing with, how we were mitigating those risks and documenting it as we went through the curriculum development, it became very easy to make the argument for making the budget available to make sure that this part of university operation was, was covered. Um, and it also made it a lot easier as we went out to engage in the larger conversation uh, to become uh, a Seren institution and to have our state join in that in, in the past year, which has been awesome for us. Um, but that would be my tips on how to engage everywhere from the highest executive levels right down to the faculty member and build that that holistic look at where does this fit in the process. 
That was terrific, Corey. I, I love looking at it from the standpoint of providing a campus service. There are so many um, offices that are institutions that that feel that this is just an onerous task that's been placed upon them, and yet you've been able to spin it um, to that you are helping with their um, ability to move forward. And I think that's really productive. And and sharing that across the whole institution from top to bottom, as you indicated, is, is such a benefit to, the, to uh, management of your work. That's really great. Great job. Thank you very much. Okay, our next presenter is Joy Verner, and she is with the Pennsylvania College of Health Sciences. Joy? Hello, and I, can you hear me now? I think yes. you can. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, wow, I, I really, it's it's interesting. I'm taking notes as I'm, I'm on the other two segments in front of me, so I'll try to get my head together now because I'm, I'm, I'm learning, and yet here, here comes some more from, from our side. So I guess to start, I should have known something dangerous was lurking around the corner when I came to Lancaster for an interview in 2014. In the room was the IR director, who is now my boss, and the HR recruiter, but there was also two other people in the room, the director of online learning and the director of financial aid. Terms like state authorization, gainful employment were being tossed around amidst other jargon of higher ed, but I had no idea what awaited me on the other side of, yes, I accept the job offer. Nine days after I started as PA College's inaugural compliance person, they hadn't had something like that in place before, um, the director of online learning gave me a color-coded map of the US showing our approval status in various states. Most of the map was gray, meaning not contacted. So there you have it. For the first eight, month, for the first eight months, I had a support role only for state authorization. Some research, a few meetings, starting the Maryland application, show of hands, we all remember that. Um, the other 99% of my job related to other compliance areas, gainful employment, Title IX, Cleary, very basic IR support and Department of Ed reporting obligations. Then came 2015 and I won the state authorization lottery. What else could I do? It was all on my plate. I had to pack my low tech, low budget state authorization toolkit, which included, don't forget the map, the internet and Outlook email and begin to navigate the rough waters of distance education compliance. Next slide, please. So just four key actions that I would say were helpful to me looking back that um, to practice daily. And these were things that I had no idea about when I was in that room with those folks who were just waiting to turn something over to the compliance person. The first, and it's the shuns of authorization. I know this is highbrow language for the academic uh, community here, but location, location, location. Programs, activities, people, drama, glitches, get out. It's like a pregame chant. This is uh, seriously what, what we're at here. It's location, it's all about that. Documentation, um, informal or formal efforts, the rationale for your decision. It's a really critical piece. You're doing outreach, you're doing phone calls, conversations, letters, actually physical letters because a lot of regulators still communicate that way fax machines, I don't even know where that is here. Um, those are the things, document, and then of course celebration and education. Under celebration, remember your first map, your first search, your first email. My team was the internet, me, myself, and I, and then running to my supervisor who was just able to kind of give me guidance and direction to point me to the right field, so to speak, to get in the, the right forest with the, the right trees. Um, and the celebration, I put Sarah smile, part of a lyric of a song, but also really the idea of finding professional groups out there like WECET, WCET, ACUP um, here in Pennsylvania. And Sarah was just something that was a hope upon hope, a light at the end of the tunnel. And that was worthy of celebration here in Pennsylvania, a big cheer. But even after Sarah, it does still depend. And the education that we are talking about, all of us in different ways, different fashions for our, for our institutions, it's educating the educators on our campuses, elevating the conversation, and energizing the players. Next slide, please. So where's Waldo? We all know about that, and it's the census of students, faculty, agents, and even billboards. It's kind of startling. It's our college, our students, our programs, our faculty, our radio ads, our billboards, our recruiters, 
it's just a lot to, to stay awake about overnight each night you go home um, but what I really learned early on after it was we had some transition and it was fully on my plate to manage this I had to get out among my colleagues on our small campus small or large it's still you got to get out and um, get out among colleagues let them know we get approved or we get out of the state so there's two prongs to the get out you get out and meet people and unfortunately as much as we have to be proactive we also sometimes have to be the one holding the stop sign like my uh, fifth grader son named Charlie who's on the safety patrol he has a huge red stop sign with a cool wooden handle and I see it every day I should have really brought it to work most days because in a lot of ways the stop sign is what we represent the wait a minute no we're not supposed to be there or, or we need to get approved to be there or did you know we were there and we'll talk more about stop signs later next slide please so it's the educational foot footprint in the world distance education geography i know about cleary geography and in higher ed we talk a lot of different things in so many different ways here for this we have distance education where are where are our people? Where are our programs? Where are our faculty? So we have the student census, as I mentioned before, from admissions inquiries that started to roll in, enrolling folks um, international locations because we have some very unique programs to healthcare. We were getting calls um, to want to enroll and be online students from Australia, Cayman Islands, China, Ghana, Honduras, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, United Kingdom, South Korea. It just kind of was a floodgate of, of moments. So we have admissions inquiries. We have faculty emails saying, hey, this current student wants to go to Haiti and complete their service learning hours or has moved to Washington State or Colorado or is moving back to their um, home abroad. Um, so again, the current students as well as um, where are people looking to come as prospective students? Um, where are these folks? Faculty census. Honestly, in my journey, I don't think I even, you know, it was a step forward, always trying to find out, but new hires, faculty also move and relocate, um, and many moving parts to state authorization. Next slide, please. In all areas of compliance, for any who have done it in any area, documentation is a critical skill to develop. Change slide, please. Because of my age demographic and my tendency toward pack writing, ask anyone in my office or my home, I like a paper trail. And I do like lots of binders, three ring binders, you know, any of these above. Um, your style may be high tech. And I know with uh, the beautiful infographic that Corey brought, I, I've got a lot to learn in that area. But there's so much that is, you know, certainly high tech, digital. And also, I still feel like many times, and maybe it's not my age demographic, but I feel like, you know, when this building stops working today and no one can get on their virtual computer, I'm going to take my binders to my Subaru and go off-site so there you know I have a, a disaster management plan but um, regardless the documentation is critical whether it's the note on the napkin or a formal letter an email whatever that might be why do we need to document so that we can prove our good faith effort so that we can show we're trying and we're doing the best we can we've read the regulations we've read the guidance and we're doing the best we can to, to make steps forward in um, being approved and being authorized and then also it offers peace of mind. It's so it's holistic. It helps you breathe. Next slide, please. I know, you know membership has its privileges. We won't say where I heard that before, but it's it's dating me again. But um, I, I truly love this and reading through a lot of the and I, a shout out to WCET or WECET. I'm not sure what's the formal way, but that's what I call you. Um, you you were like the light bulb, radio and air conditioning when I discovered these resources and, and learning and, and listservs and sharing, it became you know eye-opening and it put me on a path to be able to celebrate instead of um, be overwhelmed. So I call it the invention of Sarah. It's you know a reason to celebrate, just like we did these other household items. Sarah is a household name. And you know, I, I don't know if um, you remember this song from childhood and with everything I'm going to do a very very brief song here because sometimes we lose our part so yes I'm going to sing do you remember again I'm dating myself I'm, I'm in the 50s here um, 50 year old person when the song when you're spelling the word America don't forget to dot the I for the inventors look it up people it's true and they go through all of these inventions that have really changed the face 
of um, our, our national conversation and our ability to have these household things that make it work. Same, same is true for the invention of Sarah. Next slide, please. It is not um, it is not something that you do alone. Look at all all of these things. We have Sarah brought a lot to us. Um, and again, I think you can say this, it's fun to learn about Sarah. You could it's professional development, and these were the things that that needed to happen. Next slide, please. And again, sorry, I think there was an animation. What does that spell success? Sarah does spell success. And next slide. It's always fun to learn. I am not a big uh, Google Slides person, and I took it on to say, let's try this. So it does take a village to get the job done. It's not a solo gig. And you know, uh, there are times I, I really need to say that might be my personality and whatever work can be done. But I am not joking when I say sometimes you have to dance, and sometimes you have to sing, and sometimes you just have to find different ways to have that conversation um, start and each of us have different personalities. Mine is kind of like the overwhelming ADHD, the joy of compliance person that you know can work in some situations. But it, however that works, I think it's important to recognize that you need to stay connected with professional development. Don't lose touch with your people, um, your village people, so to speak. And there's a song that I'm not going to sing, but you know it's fun to learn about S A R A. You can work on that later. Um, Weckett state groups like ACUP and, and whatever might be in your state colleagues, listservs, it's really, really critical because I can say in the two years that I've been having the full plate of state authorization, I could not have done it without finding partners, without finding people who already tried, who had already gone before me to the frontiers out there um, and who were able to then share as we've all done today and, and throughout this. Um, and so that, again, I can't say that enough. Whether you're in a Sarah state or not, at a Sarah institution or not, inhale, exhale, repeat, and then get connected to professional development. Next slide, please. So after the exhale and after the song, we still have to continue the education because no matter what, this might be our area of focus. This might be what we do on a daily basis when we get out of the car and walk into campus, into our office. But other people are on other pages. Uh, I love, again, I, I'm, I'm going to be in touch with you, Corey, because I look at that infographic and I think, yes, I need to find these um, business practices to kind of help stop the motion. You know, my, my one little stop sign, even though there's a, a number of them here, it doesn't always work because a lot of these decisions, a lot of the budgetary decisions, a lot of the programmatic decisions, a lot of the hiring decisions are well in place and you sometimes find out about it when they post it on the website and you're like, there's a new program? Really? And then the flood of calls come in because people want to join um, from online communities everywhere because it's a unique program. So once again, stop signs. Um, in my world, that, that meant really and literally, you have to be willing to hold, you know, talk to the hand is what you have to say. February 2015, my first memory of stop signing here was in the enrollment and uh, enrollment and program marketing guidance. Um, people were asking questions. Thankfully, they asked. And then I had to do some research and begin to say, oh, yes, it, there are only certain places that we're okay to do that right now. And here's the reality. Not what they wanted to hear, but it was the fact. And then we kept working towards enhancing that and, and broadening our footprint. June 2015, Ghana, enrollment inquiry. That's when I messaged VPs um, to say, hey, um, this is something we need to talk about international because state authorization and even if Sarah comes doesn't cover that. It's we're talking about other countries and, and the same process even more, um, more complex because of all the, the things that are related to um, issues abroad. December 2015, Haiti Service Learning Site. Then we have winter, December, January, Happy New Year 2016. International enrollments are flooding. And this is when I did stop sign and a ticket because it's it's many times you just have to keep repeating, repeating, and repeating. After the exhale, you feel like you're saying the same things over and over again. And I think as the others have pointed out, trying to make those connections, be proactive, find other opportunities, as Hillary mentioned, to message um, where there might be a discussion on something that doesn't directly relate to state authorization, how can you pull it together and tie it in? 
Um, so along the way, again, we had stop signs in the spring of 2016, back to the whole address versus location, where you feel like you're in the ring and having to kind of defend your position. No, address is different than location. Yeah, I know their address is Lancaster, but where they really are is Florida, you know, and then you feel like you're moving and, and kind of having to protect yourself from the punches that feel like they're coming at times, because again, we're all colleagues, but you really have to to be able to put the stop sign up and also be able to open and embrace and say, hey, we're in this together, let's figure out a solution. Um, faculty hiring guidance, all of these things. For me, the green light, I could put down the stop sign, I still have it. The green light and proceed with caution came in January 2017 because Pennsylvania um, enabled folks like us to join SARA and became a SARA state. Next slide, please. But as Hillary mentioned, and I think for me it's been very critical, we in the institutional research here, we have legal issues in higher ed webinars. And to try and say, how can we pull things in that might not be related to state authorization exactly when we're talking about travel oversight and, and, and people traveling abroad. We don't have junior years abroad. We don't have that typical climate that might be at, at some other four-year colleges, um, but we do have people that are trying to move and do different um, kinds of medical experiences, um, service hours in other places. And so we brought together faculty, administrators, and um, staff like myself to talk about this while we're trying to create a policy for travel abroad, for international and even domestic travel, waivers, risk management, as Corey mentioned, tying it in with those huge and obvious topics that everyone is definitely committed to. The big picture, um, getting more players at the table. And as, as um, we can remember, talk amongst yourselves. Many times that's where it starts. It may or may not be a coffee talk. It might be a webinar, but together having a teachable moment, whether it's a senior leader, vice president, faculty member, um, and even students as we broaden that. Next slide, please. And this, I don't know, these are the questions. I'm, these are literally the questions that come. How am I supposed to know if she moved? You know, we find out, somebody says, I th thankfully, an advisor might send an email. I have a student who moved to Colorado or wherever it might be, New Jersey, um, and they're in XYZ program. So is that okay? And they already moved, they already relocated, they're still taking classes and is that okay? Yeah, well, here we go. So sometimes again, it's back to the basics, back to what slide two, where's Waldo? Um, where's Amanda? Where's Bob? Um, so we have the two steps forward, three steps back. And we I just really encourage you not to lose heart. I am kind of the, the solo villager sometimes here, but if it were not for finding colleagues like you, reaching out, kind of going outside of my comfort zone sometimes to ask questions, um, that's that's the way I've survived and also thrived and feel able to continue to try to learn more and progress our position here and put us in a, in a better way to, to, to educate people. Um, I remember in August 2015, it was the free range student webinar that Weckett brought. Um, and we're still trying to wrap our arms around that reality, which is how our students um, and faculty somewhat approach their lives. It's We're trying to provide education where people are. Um, so again, lots of moving parts. Um, next slide, please. Because there are lots of moving parts, it's really important to, in a way, be a megaphone. You have to megaphone your message. And that, I know megaphones are loud and sometimes they're fun too, but the idea is that we really have to broadcast that message. Um, so many moving parts, admissions, registrar, program chairs. On your campus, it might look different. Student billing, student services, whatever that might be. And students, um, that they are also being um, educated about this and what does it mean and, and bringing some messages about, hey, when you are moving, here's some obligations. Or um, I know other colleges have wonderful ways that they have um, people register for classes and verify where they live. I'm still working, you know, providing like snacks and other things to maybe get our enrollment management folks to let me consider, you know, would they please consider making it mandated that people verify where they are in terms of location where they live. Um, so in terms of that, I think, um, we are superheroes, which is, I kind of wanted to pick the superhero theme and the, the feel of this. Our superpowers, whether we like to, you know, need it or not, a compliance person kind of needs to have a big mouth, but also big ears. Communication is a key component of educating other people, um, especially in any, any compliance issue, but also learning and listening. Key, key, key. Um, as a state authorization superhero, you definitely need to use 
the power of the big ears, understanding the processes, understanding the operating procedures, understanding what's going on in all of these other areas that are connected in, in all different ways to the provision of education and our programs that are being offered to students. And then you're able to embed in the infrastructure. So it becomes like when I think of state authorization at the beginning, I said it was like being in the, you know, a, a kind of a storm, it was the, the um, rough waters. Well, if I'm going to be in a storm, I would rather be in the basement near the foundation than, you know, sitting in the attic by the roof. So that's where, you know, build it in, embed it in the infrastructure. Next slide, please. So you know the four action steps to add to your toolkit. So I had my map, I had the internet, I had Outlook, and I'm also adding location, documentation, celebration, education. Um, it, pretty, you get the concept here. You see it all. It's it's pretty much easy to to consider. But when I think about panoramic under celebration, this this idea of a panoramic perspective, it's really important to have an unobstructed view in all directions. We have to be that panoramic view of what's going on. As Corey and Hillary have both pointed out, there's so many moving parts and so many people involved um, bringing it together, the, the big picture. And I think also we, we can't forget whether national reciprocity is something you can celebrate yet. I will always celebrate it. We'll have Sarah parties maybe even in a month. I don't know. I might have to. Um, reciprocity does rock. There's a t-shirt. I don't know. Um, but we also have to remember our campus milestones because whether or not Sarah is available to you um, or even if it is, there's still the campus milestones, the innovation and the collaboration that happens on our campuses as we seek to enrich the education of students. So there's two more shuns that I could add. Um, and the bonus takeaway, and I think this you know, is important too, do not forget um, to give yourself a standing ovation. You could stand where you are right now or simply raise your virtual glass and, and give yourself a round of applause. Um, because I think for anything in all of this, it can feel lonely in a compliance realm, even when you do have people to share with and you find your professional development. Um, but again, keep going back, your education, um, their education, their meaning those around us, you kind of have to say the sky is sort of falling. Chicken Little says, you know, the sky is falling or it's sort of falling or at least will you please look up? That's kind of our role. Please look up, we say. And then for students, um, you know, our reason to be, that's what it's all about. And so let, let's let never forget that, I guess, that connection. Um, and shout out again to Kentucky in spring when I went down to a conference. It was a huge turning point for me. And I can only say to the folks um, listening, whether you're um, years in this field or just starting out, find those people in those places because they will be huge turning points for you. Next slide, please. And I think that as we remember the, that we do, you know, we've always heard we wear many hats and I think a lot of people say that, but I really believe compliance people can own that for sure. Um, please, in addition to that, please, please make a cape and maybe put on it, it still depends um, because we already have enough hats and we need a few more capes on campus. And I thank you uh, to all of you who've given to my learning and I will be calling for advice and guidance. Uh, thanks to all of you. And thanks for letting me be here today. That was terrific, Joy. I really appreciate uh, your um, presenting your, your view of working with key stakeholders. I, I think we've seen some common themes through these three presenters. They obviously have a variety of styles, which just made it even more impactful to me to be able to learn from you. And so I'm so grateful to the three of you for being here today and providing this wonderful information. And I think one of the main common themes I saw here was the ability for you all to work with other offices in your institution, reach out to them. You need to show initiative, and all three of our presenters uh, talked about that. And to um, and wow, Joy, I never thought that my job was so interesting. You've made it really um, uh, an interesting topic area, and my, my kids will be pleased when I share with them how fun, actually, our work is. Um, so thank you for the very colorful display and sharing of uh, your information as well. We have a few questions questions. Um, I, I'm seeing that uh, someone has asked, and I believe this is for Corey. Corey, um, you mentioned a rubric. Is this something that you could make available for us to be able to share with our participants? Yeah, absolutely. I'll have, uh, I'll, I'll have Amanda Babcock here at the University of Utah pass that along to Cheryl and WCET to share out with everybody. Terrific. And I will be able to share that out with you all when we send the, um, the recording and the slides. 
Uh, let's see. I have another question here. Uh, Corey, if course development team was outsourced, how would you handle it? Uh, if it were outsourced, I would work with my my contractor, my OPM provider, or whomever to make sure that they weave that state authorization check into their process. Again, it's just a conversation with your partner about where is state authorization going to happen in our process as we partner with you and, and you deliver to us. It just becomes a deliverable that they are responsible for. Thank you. Uh, Joy, this is to you. Uh, what conference were you referring to in Kentucky that you found helpful? My apologies. That was the WCET, and Cheryl, you would know better because it was my first experience, um, State Authorization Network Conference uh, today. Uh, again, that was the first time that I ex was exposed to doing that, so that would have been a real name. 